Two Berlin with a stupid grin. Which screws loose, where do you begin? I call my dude and tell him what room I'm in and moon him from the window with the loony bin. He's fuming, because I'm really being rude again. I ruin my connection to my human kin, and so I'm moving into the kennel. Settle down where it's goof troops, snoop, and it's juice and gin. I took my tile and all, I took a violent fall when I tried to crawl up the asylum wall. Watsky, Sip and Carla, Rassi, and all the facts and ladies, I can drunk dial them all, because I can be in 17 places at once, while 17 means puff 170 blunts, and one I'm chiefing in DC with Eric Holder. I'm sharing marijuana with the mayor of Boulder, Colorado, but the bears. Shit! The air is colder when I'm in the South Pole where the bears are polar. I crap on the critics who deny my place and wipe my ass with the fabric of time and space. Hello and welcome to Daddy Issues, the podcast where we talk about father and son relationships in popular culture. My name's Dominic Archer and there, spitting tunes like a cobra spits venom was David Bryan and I am referencing this so he has to leave it in. There's not going to be I was any... going to say, I'm definitely editing that out. There's going to be no editing of that rap magnificence. I almost wanted to do the introduction halfway through just to ensure you had to leave it in. But I didn't want to, to, to ruin your f- sweet, sweet flow. <laughs> well, well, thanks for that. And now so it's we're going to have to, we're going to start again. No, no, we are absolutely not starting again. We are, we are going all the way with this. So, what, what would you like to say of, of, of which song is that? Why did you, why did you choose that one to, to get yourself ready and, and good to go? I don't know. That was, I remember back in one of my old jobs. It was quite boring in a warehouse. I would pass the time by um, printing out lyrics to tricky or fast rap songs and put them on the wall. So every time that I went past, I would take the time to try and ma- memorize it. And that one was um, No Flex Zone by Watsky and Carmen. And that's the first <laughs> Watsky verse. Um, I see. But yeah, Not No I, Flex I never... Zone by, by Ray Stramond, which is... Um, no. no, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's the one that goes, No Flex Zone. No Flex Zone, that's it, that's the song. Oh, that's, that is the verse of this version too. The, the, the female uh, rapper. I see. Carmen well, I, does that I, bit in the, in the verse. I wonder who is referencing what then. Maybe Ray Stremond are, are referencing uh, this this other one. I doubt it. But but Ray <laughs> Stremond, uh, one is they're two brothers, and one of them is Swa Lee, the guy who's become like super famous now. He's on the Spider Man Into the Spider Verse soundtrack and oh, stuff. Oh really? Yeah. So oh, okay. Yeah, they then? they were kind of like um like uh, uh, B grade hip-hop like they were like teenagers kind of like almost like Jaden smith or justin bieber kind of thing when they were together but they're like very overly produced and stuff and then swali has kind of started doing his own thing and now he's like super famous on his own and it's like the, the other day I, I was listening to um unforgettable by french montana featuring swali which has like a billion views and i, I hadn't watched the video before and i was like Hang on, Swally's the guy from Ray Stram. I know him. I used to laugh at him in those videos <laughs> with his brother, and now he's got like over a billion views. He's on the Spider Man soundtrack. We're not here to talk about this, but uh, you know, it's an interesting introduction. Yeah, it's, it's, it was natural, organic. You know, people feel like they've just walked in on our conversation, which they kind of have. So, uh, <laughs> kind of have. but it it does lead us into a little bit into our topic that we're we're going to be talking about today. Considering, I'm guessing that. That that harap you just gave us is fairly old school. No, that I think that came out like twenty thirteen or something. That's pretty old school for me. <laughs> is it? Yeah, no, no, no. But it does kind of lead us into part of our topic today because today on Daddy Issues we're going to be uh, talking and honouring the uh, the the late great MF Doom. Um, talking about some of his songs and uh, what we really liked about him. Uh, and then, you know, his uh, his life as, as a father. But before we get into that, and kind of what, what led me on to wanting to talk about MF Doom in the first place, is one of the greatest uh, manga series of all time. It's something we've brought up on a whole bunch of episodes, especially the Mandalorian episode, because it's the foundational text that the Mandalorian is just aping off of. Um, and it is... The manga Lone Wolf and Motherfucking Cub. <laughs> Full title. Yes, that's what I've been calling it while I've, I've been reading it through. Just I, I read it, I'm like, oh man, Lone Wolf and Cub is really good. Oh my god, Lone Wolf and Cub is really good. Oh my god, Lone Wolf and Motherfucking Cub, it's so good. That's kind <laughs> of that's how I, Yeah, that's how I've been feeling about it. And part of the reason that um, MF Doom and Lone Wolf and Cub tied together for me 
is I started reading Lone Wolf and Cub uh, in December, and then later in December, MF Doom, uh, well, they announced that, that he'd passed away, so I was kind of reading uh, reading it and then listening to a lot of his stuff as I was going back. Um, but because of Lone Wolf and Cub, and I was trying to find out more about it, it led me to uh, the track Books of War by Omega Red, the DJ Omega Red, not the X-Men villain. Um, and the uh, the song Books of War features MF Doom and, and RZA, who's obviously uh by that you super... mean the rizza yes yeah sure. the rizza the jizza the there's a whole thing i can't remember how it goes but yeah you kind of set that tone because there's there's the rizza and then there's the jizza and then there's that um female Box singer it's quite big now called the scissor which is s s z a it's oh. a whole it's a whole thing it's like okay. a clan oh well that's that's a lot of things for me to find out about but obviously as well as being a very successful uh, rapper and hip-hop producer himself, RZA, if we're going to call him that, I generally just call him RZA, <laughs> um, is well known for his anime and manga appearances as well, such as Afro Samurai and uh, you know all of the work that he's done with Japanese-inspired uh, manga and anime-inspired work. So, um, yeah, he yeah, did we've... a movie as well, didn't he? Um, the Man with the Iron Fists. Yes, yeah. Did he direct that? I think he directed it, yeah. I don't know if he wrote it, but he definitely directed it and he was in it. I think yeah. he was the man with the iron fists. Right. Um, I think Tarantino helped him with it and it had a bunch of well, weird cast of like Russell Crowe and Dave Bautista, Lucy Liu was in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they called in a lot of favours for that movie. I've been really meaning to yeah. watch it actually because I listened to the soundtrack a bunch because <laughs> it's really cool. I was going to say, is it watched good? It. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's kind of our connection between uh, between Lone Wolf and Cub uh, and and this is the the track "Books of War" by Omega Red with MF Doom, uh, featuring RZA. Oh, that sounds wrong. He's been RZA Day for so long. Um, uh, it's not an official track. It's a remix that uh, that Omega Red did, taking like a an Indonesian or Filipino song, and then which is where like the beat and stuff comes from, and then he's put. MF Doom and uh, and Az- Azadeh on top of it, um, and the the YouTube video for it that's got like thirty one million views. It's an awesome song. Is Lone Wolf and Cub, and mm. uh, so I was listening to this track while I was reading Lone Wolf and Cub, and then MF Doom himself passed away, and it was like right, that's it. They're all in one collective ball of awesomeness. <laughs> they all live together in your brain now, like they're, they're yes connected yeah. indefinitely. Yeah. yeah, and it's kind of a, and that's one of the things that that's so cool about uh, about RZA, Ugh. is that you, it's the kind of music that you can listen to while you read a lot of manga and like especially manga like Lone Wolf and Cub that's incredibly cinematic, and it's the, you mm. can it adds another layer to the experience, right? It's it's not distracting you from uh from the experience. It's kind of adding something to it, and that's what makes what makes his soundtracks and stuff so amazing for those various animes and yeah like afro samurai and awesome things. yeah afro samurai is great yeah i mean i bought the um xbox 360 game mm-hmm. when it came out ignoring all reviews because i was like but this is the coolest game i could possibly have imagined yes and yeah that the the lore of the of that universe is so fucking cool so playing through it was amazing even though the gameplay was a kind of dog shit but it looked great and it sounded great and uh, yeah but that's one of those games that you buy when it, i bought when it came out and after about a year or two, when you think, oh, maybe I'll trade this in or I'll take it to CEX or whatever, and it's worth 20p. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, not much replay value on that one. No, I, I remember, I think I tried to play your copy of it and it just, uh, I think I got about 10 minutes in and then was like, it's too frustrating. <laughs> the, threw it to it the is, ground. It is the, well frustrating. Yeah, yeah. the controls. I don't, I don't just think I ever not... finished it. But Do you know what? If it, it had been made by the people who did X Men Origins Wolverine, the game, it would have yeah. been sweet because that was the best. Uh, the maybe the only video game adaptation that's better than the movie was oh wow yeah i mean the, that's a very slim category <laughs> yes yeah i can't think of anything else actually no well let's get into lone wolf and cub which i don't think has a, a game adaptation but it has more movie adaptations than there are there are under the sun so we'll definitely have to come back to those at some point but today we're just going to talk about the manga specifically the first volume the assassin's road uh, which is yeah, our introduction to Lone Wolf and Cub, which is written by Kazuo Kayoke. Very 
very sorry for I think yeah we should probably say f- straight away we're going to garble and completely uh, yeah I don't know disrespect the pronunciations of a lot of these Japanese names because uh, neither of us are Japanese and no. at least but, in my case most of my experience of pronouncing Japanese names comes from footballers so I'm not quite sure that I've ever done it right but um I'll, we'll do our best and yes. <laughs> don't mean yes. any disrespect yeah well it's also a problem with a lot of manga and anime is that they they tend to often have uh western names as well like the, the super famous ones like uh attack on titan or former El alchemist that kind of set within germany um they're, they're shouting like european names with japanese accents and so yeah yeah oh, it, yeah don't have that much uh that much practice but it's it's um it's out of naivety not out of insult so, uh, yes. yes, we're written by Kazuo Kayoke, and uh, the amazing, incredible artist is Koseki Kojima. Uh, first released in 1970, this book, and boy, it has not aged a day. I, to my mind, if this was released today, I would buy it and think, oh my god, this looks amazing. Whereas you buy like a Marvel comic from the 1970s, like a, a 70s issue of Spider-Man or something, and you're like, oh, this is dated somewhat. But Lone Wolf and Cub is one of those kind of immortal texts. Like you could pick it up in 100 years and still it's just art, just pure, pure art. So I've read I've read a, a fair amount of Lone Wolf and Cub and been trying to pressure you in, into doing it for a while. <laughs> Um, so what, what did you think? You, you've read volume one, the Assassin's Road. What did you make of it? Um, I didn't read volume one. I read volume one, then volume two, then volume three, and then volume four. And I had to stop to start writing some notes down because we were running out of time before we had to record this. Um, and I started reading it at 11 PM last night, (laughs) but I just couldn't, I couldn't stop. I couldn't put it down. It's brilliant. And I, um, I think I knew the age, or the, at least the time where it first was released, vaguely, but it wasn't till after I'd fi- I stopped reading and I actually, um, or maybe um, in Frank Miller's introductions, he mentions a bit of history about it. Um, it w- yeah, it wouldn't have struck me. I'm completely with you. If it had, if it had been put out in the 21st century, it would have seemed completely appropriate because the the artwork is incredible, all yeah. in in pen and pencil and black and white, but. It looks absolutely amazing, and there are certain panels that I just I stared at for ages because they were art. It take I think it goes beyond just a comic or a graphic novel for in in a large sense, and that's probably a big part of why it's so enduring. Yeah, it's without a doubt one of the most influential uh, manga, at least in within the Western. Uh, within like for western audiences like you look at the people who want to make hollywood adaptations of lone wolf and cub and it's like aronofsky wants to adapt lone wolf and cub and you know frank miller's writing the introductions for them in like this the 70s and 80s and he was at that point probably the most important american artist and he did a lot of the cover art for the versions that, that we're reading like it's yeah the english frank language miller's versions, cover. Yeah. yeah yeah and a lot of his uh, his work on Daredevil brings in these Japanese inspirations, which is where you get like the hand, the ninjas, you know, the immortal oh. ninjas, the hand in Daredevil, and um, um, uh, wasn't that the name of the uh, the Ronin, ninja Ronin the henchman guys in Jackie Chan Adventures as well? Very possibly, yes. Also, the hand. The hand. <laughs> but then also, what what is the name of the ninja clan in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? The Foot Clan. That's right, because Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was initially a piss take of Daredevil. Was it really? Yes. So the, the story of Daredevil is is a young boy, Matt Murdock, uh, which we will have to do an episode about Daredevil if we're talking about daddy issues. Put it on the list. We're doing Daredevil. But Matt Murdock, as a young boy, gets chemical waste thrown on his eyes and gains superpowers, right? But the initial story of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is there is an accident where radioactive waste is thrown and it's supposed to have, you know, hit Matt Murdock and then it goes down into the sewers and it hits some turtles. So the Not really? Yeah, so the origin wow. of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is supposed to be the same origin as uh, as Daredevil. Because the whole thing was like Frank Miller is doing this utterly ridiculous story about a blind mutant radioactive guy who fights these ninjas and it's very serious. 
So they made these four turtles who were fighting the Foot Clan, and they went, "Oh, they're teenagers, and they're, they're like everything that could be popular, right?" They've like they say Powerbunga and yeah, skateboard yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then it actually became a, a you know a thing of its own and became the most popular you know pro like uh, I don't know title I guess of of the eighties and nineties. It got in movies, it got TV shows, you know, cartoons, whatever, and uh, yeah, international acclaim. And all to take the piss out of Frank Miller. So another reason that I like it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But going back to, to Lone Wolf and Cub, um, oh, it, it's just great. Let's that, that's, that's, that's get into it. So uh, the overall story for, for Lone Wolf and Cub is uh, we have Ogami Ito, who is the Lone Wolf, and his, uh, and his son, Diagoro. And uh, should we call him Ogami? That's his family name, his clan name. Or should we call him Ito? What do you think? I think uh, I was going to call him Ogami, yeah. All right, let's go with Ogami then. So, although I guess that it's also Ogami Diagoro, maybe? But yeah, we'll just go with, let's go with it Ogami. It is, yeah, yeah. That yeah. is their family name. So it's Ito yeah. and Diagoro, or however we're going to yeah, pronounce it. Yeah, yeah, but... yeah. So um, Ogami is the, the Shogun's executioner, which we get a lot more detail about what that kind of means for us um less informed about Japanese history. As the as the book goes on, we find out more about what his role was as the Shogun's executioner. But he was, you know, one of the most important people within the kingdom. And uh, we, we start the Assassin's Road with the reveal that he is not going to commit seppuku and kill himself. He's going to defy the Shogun's orders. And uh, it's just him and his son fleeing from the shogun and the shogun's men trying to survive in uh, in medieval japan and it's awesome it is awesome. it is awesome yeah yeah the, i think isn't that the the setup is for some I, I maybe i missed it i think but um the he's been wrongfully accused or framed for trying to overthrow the shogun as as he is his kind of right hand man instrument of death executioner they even call him like the shogun's decapitator mm. or frank miller calls him that in one of those intros um yeah and for some reason the shogun decides to get rid of him or at least he's done with him and thinks he can just tell him to end his own life but ogami makes that takes a decision not to yeah to take on yeah to walk the assassin's road instead mm. have you got to that bit uh to the volume yet i think it's either volume f- maybe five or six that delves more into that uh that origin story no i don't think the last one i read um is volume four is called flute uh, the flute of the fallen tiger where he fights those three ninja brothers oh that's a good um, one. that's a cool one that was a great one. Yeah, yeah. so I know if I don't think I've got as far okay. as um, the, what you're talking right. about. Yeah, all right. We'll we'll leave that for now then, because there's, there is a deeper explanation of of what leads him into uh, to to walking the assassin's road. But for this first volume, um, it doesn't give us too much information, as you're saying. Just that, yeah, he's he's betrayed, or he's been accused of betraying the shogun, falsely accused of betraying the shogun, um, and he's expected to take his own life. Uh, in the traditional act of, of, of seppuku. And this is kind of what plays into his role as the executioner as well, because um, seppuku is that famous uh, thing you've seen in a million movies where they take the, the sword and cut themselves from one side of the, you know, one side of the body to the other. Um, mm. Yeah, taking themselves. Disembowelment. Yeah. yeah. And then the role of the executioner, the shogun's executioner, is to be there. So once the, the, the person has done this, the executioner then decapitates them. Right. So it's yeah. like you, you've done the act, you've disemboweled yourself, but rather than waiting for you to suffer and die miserably, this person is here to end your misery and, and, and send you. Yeah, it's away. an honorable way to end. You, mm. you take, you, you know, you do the respectful, honorable thing by ending, by doing the disembowelment of your own but then the execution had to be like well done and then off off with the head yeah. get it over with quick and yeah so yeah so the executioner has to be like a masterful swordsman because if it's like takes like three or four hacks at it you know like you can imagine like with a blunt axe one of those executioners in like france or something just like hacking to try and get someone's head off yeah. you know it's like uh, that's yeah. you know, that's not going to that's not going to do it for the shogun you know, like you've yeah, got and I to imagine be... as well, like if there are ever any people who 
who either refuse or are too cowardly to take their own life and they fight back, the execution needs to be basically undefeatable. Yeah. Which Ogami certainly is. Yes. <laughs> At least in these first four chapters and his reputation as from his time as the shoguns and um what does it what do they call it? yeah let's call him so i what did frank miller call him the decapitator i love that <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah during his time in service he was feared across all of japan for how deadly he was yeah and he is as we as we go through similar to the mandalorian which is very much as we said pulling influence like ogami is like the bad asses, the, the most badass of all badasses. Like, everyone he encounters is like, this guy's a badass warrior. They're almost legendary. And then Ogami just, like, annihilates them, essentially. But not yeah. always because he's so good. It's not like, um, as we, we see in, we see later in, in this first uh, issue, The Assassin's Road, um, he, it's not always that he's the best swordsman, but often he's more wily or he's more uh he's he's thinking things through like other people are just going about their their business of it's my duty to kill you right or honor determines that we have to duel but ogami's like he's an honorable man but he's not beyond a little bit of trickery either you know he's not he's not too far gone within the world of honor to to you know He'll throw a couple of tricks in there. He's the kind of guy that would chuck dirt in your eyes or something, you know. If he, yeah, if he has yeah, he does to. that actually in the in the the flute of the fallen tiger when he's fighting the ninja dudes. He yeah, he uses, takes that tact. Yeah, but he's also just like, like fearless. Mm. Like in in the first issue in assass in um, the assassin's road when um, he's given this mandate by a bunch of the shogun's men to commit Harry Carry and he says nah, not going to do it. And he stands up to face them. They're all a little bit taken aback. It's like, you've defied the Shogun's command and they will just like, kill him, cut him down. He just stands there. He doesn't even actually immediately, I'm looking at the panel now, that all of these men pull out their swords and he doesn't really even move or flinch. He just, just, just talks back at them. Like, you think you can kill me? You and your puny men? And the, all the while he's holding his son, Daigoro, under his arm. Yeah. Like a, <laughs> like yeah. a, like a pig. And they're all, they're all a little bit reluctant to, to dive in and it takes their chief or captain or whatever to be like what are you standing there waiting for attack and then that it turns out to be a mistake yeah it was absolutely a mistake if i remember yeah. correctly he cut two guys go to attack him and he cuts their blade in half i think he like chops both of their swords in half and like the yeah, tips of their blade of their... go into the ceiling or something like yeah, that. yeah exactly yeah and they're kind of like um and then they get gutted just yeah yeah and it's like ah oh, ogami is badass but let's, let's rewind yeah. slightly from there because the Assassin's Road starts with uh, with a, a bouncing ball. You know, two girls are, are playing with a, playing with a bouncing ball, and as they're walking around, the the baby cart assassin, as he becomes known, which is Ogami and with his son, um, they're just walking the Assassin's Road, I suppose, um, and they see the the ball bouncing. You know, Diagora is looking out from his carts, watching the the ball and thinking, oh, wouldn't it be fun to, to be a kid? But it gives them a chance to, to reminisce. And I guess this first issue really is a flashback, isn't it? Um, or at least the, the yeah. first section of it is, because uh, volume one also has a, a, a longer story that, that we get into. But um, yeah, this this first bit is they're, they're on the road um there you know the, these things have already happened but they we have a chance to reminisce and the, the ball bounces it says father and son watch and remember and we flash back um to a really awesome character introduction um which is when uh ogami gives his son the cho the choice between the assassin's life or death which is uh, yeah. at the very beginning, yeah. Do you it's wanna, a heavy uh, choice. Yeah, do you want to explain a little bit of that? Sure. I mean, uh, you t actually, you um, took the time to tell me that Daigoro is meant to be about four or five years old at this point. Um, yeah. Even though um, I suppose he kind of maybe looks that age when we very first meet them, sort of in the, the quote-unquote present when he's in the baby cart watching the girls. But then at during that flashback... He suddenly he's, looks like he's a baby. definitely what, like, definitely a baby. Yeah, he's yeah. like two or three years old. Yeah, and um, so having had um, Ogami's wife murdered already, um, and he knows that he's been given this mandate to kill himself, 
he's decided he's not going to do that, but he gives his son, who's yeah, a toddler, the choice. Yeah. Um, either choose the ball. He has a choice between a ball and a sword, and he says, "Choose the ball and join your mother in heaven." Essentially. Yeah, or, like, I'll, I'll kill you, and you know, and you can yeah, join your mother in heaven. I mean, yeah. talking about yeah. how badass this guy is, and how unwavering and brutal, and he's the, the protagonist hero of our story but it opens in like four pages in him giving his t- two three four year old child the option for him to kill him and he'll do it like he, <laughs> yeah there's yeah. no that's, there's nothing no emotional there's nothing emotional in this it's just very matter of fact no but it's such but then, a good such good writing is it diagora you must choose a road for yourself choose the tamari which is the ball and join your mother who awaits you in yomi land of the spirits and yeah, choose the sword, it. and together we will walk the assassin's road. And this kid's two years old. Like, he probably only knows the word for ball. And, yeah. and that's it, you know. But he says, he goes, I know you can't understand your father's words or what will come to pass, but within your body flows the blood of the Agami clan, and your heart will decide. It's <sighs> like, fucking hell, man. Low wolf and motherfucking cub! Yeah. And he's like, choose! Yeah. And he, then, then uh, Daigoro walk, sort of crawls over going ga 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 like baby yeah. talk yeah. looks between the two of them and eventually heads for the sword yeah he almost goes for the ball you know you get that yeah, bit he, where he's looking he at the ball it. he's like yeah but uh, and then uh our hero replies you would have been happier at your mother's side my poor son yeah. which means that he was hoping that he would kill him and yeah, like, it looks uh, like he's got a tear. Yeah, Ogami's like, yeah, he's crying. He's, he's crying at this eye, point. Yeah. yeah, and it's he doesn't want to put his son through this dishonorable life of walking the assassin's road. You know, that life is a ronin. There's you know, uh, well, something even more than something even less, I suppose, less than a ronin is as an assassin. Um, but they're gonna do it together, father and son. Yeah. Which is when, uh, as you the, the scene you were talking about earlier on, where the uh, the the group enter and demand that he surrenders himself, and uh, uh, you know tell him to to commit seppuku, which he laughs literally laughs at them. They're yeah, like they say something them. they say something like oh, you're wearing white, which means you know you're you're here to accept your your death or something like that. Yeah. So your resolution is admirable, yeah, because he's wearing the white clothes of the traditional white clothes of death. Yeah. And he says, "We do not wear these clothes to commit harikiri. These are the ceremonial robes of a new departure. From this day forward, father and son tread the road to hell." Oh. And, then, and they're like, "What?" And he sort of gets to his feet and grabs his sword, and they're like, "What? The f- Wait, no, what?" Yes. Yeah. And the Shogun's orders it. are absurd, and then he he messes these guys up. They don't they don't dare to attack him, but. The, the ones that do the ones that do a cut down um and we get this is when we get our first big cinematic shot right which is this is the only thing that i think maybe dates the comic somewhat is that the art uh is spread across those two pages like that where you get these yeah, long of sweeping panels yeah it's incredibly cinematic like they they're clearly referencing um a lot of i think well japanese cinema and and things like that um, it doesn't look like even a, a normal manga or, or how comics normally look. It's sweeping, a sweeping page. Uh, it's gorgeous, it's really gorgeous. Yeah, I, th- I really like that about this book. Yeah, I think it looks yeah. brilliant. And every time it does that, uh, something dramatic and amazing is about to happen, basically. Like something beautiful but violent. And yeah, it's it's really great. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so after he's he's messed up some dudes, as as he <laughs> does... As Ogami yeah. does, still with his son under his arm, uh, the other clan enters the the Yagyu, the Yagyu, y- Yagyu. I'm gonna call them the Yagyu. Yagyu, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Yagyu That's clan, right. and this these are the guys uh, who appear to have framed him, essentially. Uh, and we again we find out more about that in in the later volume. But these are the people who have, uh, you know have told the shogun your executioner betrayed you right and you're you know he's gonna have to kill himself we're gonna go take care of it because they want his power they want his position he's an honorable man who would never betray the shogun but he knows that it's a lie right and it's the yagyu clan that have done it and they probably killed his wife and he's 
not happy about it. Um, and there's a, another great use of those long panels again that establishes the the Yagyu clan, and then it's him facing off against uh, the 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 head of the Yagyu clan, I suppose. Yeah, like the, I guess he's like the yeah the I don't know is chief the right word or the yeah the yeah. But uh, th- he's facing off, and uh, the guy's like, "Do you?" He think... looks like Moses in the Bible. He does. Yeah, he does. <laughs> he's bearded. He's got a big stick and long robes. Yeah, and there's that awesome bit where uh, he goes, "You're no match for the swords of the Yagyu clan," and uh, Agami, holding his son under his arms, just shrugs. Right, yeah. it literally it says, says shrug. shrug, like bring it. it, it to me, it's like, oh yeah. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, yeah. What have you got? I think he, as he shrugs, uh, he he reveals that the crest of the shogun, and it's got this almost religious power over these guys, right? They're like they can't bring themselves to possibly, to possibly fight him now, um, because you know the, the the symbol of the shogun's there, and it would be, I suppose, it would be almost traitorous to attack a man with that official, but even though he's yeah, a traitor treason, at this yeah. point, yeah, 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 to attack someone with that crest would be would be terrible um and he's like uh they're, they're like take it off take it off so we can kill you <laughs> basically yeah take that crest off so we can kill you and um he's like no way like you know i'm, I'm not stupid um and uh, the the chief of the yagyu clan has uh, a proposition for him which leads us into our next most awesome moment uh, i'll let you take over for for this bit well yeah the the yagyu guy says shed that crest shed it and we challenge you to a fair duel. Win, and you are free to go anywhere you choose, so long as it is beyond the borders of End uh, Edo, which is like the medieval word for uh, the capital, which is mm. modern day Tokyo, where the where the shogun shogun is based. Um, and Nogami says, "And if I refuse, Yagyu chief says the assassins of the Yagyu clan will track you to the ends of the earth. We must stop this now. If we allow him to wear the shogun's crest, this affair will never end." Um, and uh, the someone sort of chimes in and says to the Yagyu guy, "Listen, if he's wearing the crest, you can't do this. Like mm-hmm. this, this is it." And he's like, "Don't interfere with my with responsibility is mine. The dignity of the throne is at stake. We have no choice. What do you say?" And Agami accepts the challenge because he is awesome. That's why. And yeah. then I think I think it's the next page after that. It is just the most beautiful double page spread. It's incredible. Where, I don't know uh, how they could just do that with just ink and lines. I know. The, the beginning of um, issue four with the um, the flute with the fallen tiger. It's like a mm-hmm. there's a shot like uh, shot. So I'm, all, I'm talking about it like it's yeah similar. yeah yeah yeah. Um, it, there's a there's a two page spread like this, but it's all ocean at night. And mm. I was like, that was one of those where I just had to look at it for ages because it's just all done with lines and it looks yeah. so good. Yeah, it's um, it's uh, it's incredible. It is incredible. Kojima yeah. is just is yeah, just yeah. stunningly, stunningly good. Yeah, they they give us a little bit more backstory and explanation of the different clans and, and the roles mm. of everybody, um, but how ultimately, um, you know, Ogami is is going to be leaving the hierarchy and become something you know something lesser, something without honor by becoming an assassin, essentially. Um, yeah, but the the. The duel is set up between the the warrior of the, the Yagyu clan and between Ogami. Um, and Ogami's having to fight with the sun in his eyes. Right, He has to fight with the sun in his eyes and he has to fight with his baby on his back. Uh, against a, 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 a maybe an, you know, a, an equally skilled swordsman. Maybe not equally skilled because Ogami is you know, the, the, you know, the most badass of the badasses. But he's fighting with the sun in his eyes and with the baby on his back. And everyone is like, you know, the, the Yagyu guy watching on is like, I think he said, oh, there we go. The duel is already decided, right? Like, if skill is equal, then the environment is against him and he's got a baby. You know, what chance does this guy stand? Like, he's stupid to go into this fight, basically. Like, yeah. he has to know he can't win. Uh, and we get another amazing shot as they, they charge each other. The, these two samurai charge each other. And Ogami shouts, Dear Goro, we enter the portals of hell. <laughs> God. He There's is. this great kind of... Um, I'm trying to think of what it reminds me of, but this kind of anti-hero character who um, has this 
kind of almost mystical power and and uh, unassailability because they've already they've they've, they've come to, uh, to peace with the with their destiny and they know that mm. they're they're doomed essentially yeah. so they've got nothing to lose i think what i read recently that reminds me of this is um batman lovers and madmen and uh-huh. uh, the the joker in that is very much the same where he's kind of so deadly and so powerful and so impressive because he just doesn't care like he welcomes death and the combining that with his undoubted skill and and uh and ability it kind of makes him yeah undefeatable to normal people who have some sense of fear or self-preservation yeah or, who have limitations yeah limitations yeah mm. exactly whereas ogami essentially fights without limitations you know like uh, or he's always he's always got some way of overcoming his limitations and that's kind of what we see here as um, as the two of them charge at each other and the art as Ogami charges literally opens up. It's, I think he's running into the setting sun again because we're we're looking at it in black and white. It looks like mm. he's running into the sun or into a portal, you know, into the portal yeah. to hell that he's talking about. Um, but as these these two warriors run towards each other, Ogami drops his head, and behind him on his back is Diogoro, his son, who he's been carrying the whole time. That everyone said is a burden. But on his head, he's got a tiny little mirror, uh, like a, yeah. a, mir- a, a, a face-sized mirror on the baby's head that reflects the sunlight back with a flash, it says. And the man charging into him unexpectedly has the blinding light of the setting sun shot straight into his eyes. Yeah, and they do that awesome thing that we, I think we've all seen, if you've seen any kind of samurai movie where two guys charge at each other and there's like a they both swing their swords at the same time and then they end up being back to back a couple of feet apart and there's just that quiet yeah this pause and they're both just in their stances and you're not sure who's got who and i think there are a lot of like there are some star wars fights that are like this as well with lightsabers where um there's just this yeah this really unerring quiet and you're just waiting to see who's going to hit the deck and yeah, it's the Yagyu chief who drops to the ground. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's what I was saying earlier on about Ogami being willing to to throw the dirt, right? It's that mm. ev- everyone's gone into this fight like he's already lost, right? He's carrying the baby and he's got the sun in his eyes. You know, he's he's set himself at such a disadvantage, no matter how good a swordsman he is, you know, he can't overcome those, those uh, weaknesses. But because nobody expects him to turn those weaknesses to his advantage. And that's what makes him such a cool character. Is not only is he the best swordsman, but he'll also shine the sun in your eyes using the baby. Right? No one thinks, yeah. nobody thinks he's going to use the baby as a weapon, but there's Diogoro playing his part. Right, They're walking the road together. Um, and you know, father and son are, t- are together in this duel. You know, if they live, they live together. If they die, they die together. And they both play a role in in doing it. And yeah, uh, yeah amazing shot of the, the Yagyu warrior slumped on the floor, uh, blood spurting in the air across the, the setting the setting sun. And it's just... Yeah. God. And then the, the, yeah, it transitions from the sun back to the bouncing ball. And yeah, the, the ball was the choice... Uh, the, the girls bouncing the ball the ball was the choice that that diagoro had to make and he chose the the assassin's road with his father and that's kind of that's the setting of of the whole series from there um and yeah it's so cool so cool really cool it reminds me have you seen oh, crap i really can't even remember what it's called it was like um crouching tiger hidden dragon came out in like 2001 2002 and it kind of brought um chinese cinema to Hollywood, really. Uh, the Chow Young Fat and Xi mm. Zhang were the stars of that, weren't they? And Michelle, Michelle Yeo was in it, I think. Hell yeah. And then the film came out a little bit after that, and it had Takeshi Kaneshiro in it. I think it was a Chinese film, but it had Takeshi Kaneshiro, a Japanese actor. Um, and uh, maybe Xi Zhang was in that one as well. Um, it's called The House of Flying Daggers. The yes. House of Flying Daggers. Yes. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, that's got those kind of sword fights where people slide past each other and mm. then suddenly like guts fall out of someone. <laughs> yeah. It's a <laughs> very anime thing. Very anime yeah. as well. You get that. It's 
Yeah, it's like it's like jousting almost, but with the satisfaction of suspense. Because with jousting, if you watch something like A Knight's Tale, awesome movie. Also, yeah. Father and Son, write it down. But the <laughs> um, the the thing about Knight's Tale is it builds the suspense of when the jousts will hit. Right, who is going to get hit? And once they get hit, you have the satisfaction of them being launched off the horse. Right. Yeah. But with the the samurai movement, you get the suspense of who's going to hit, and then you you feel the the impact, but then you still have to wait. Right, and it's like the suspense takes it it'd be like jousting and you get hit and then you have a delay of five seconds before someone flies off the horse and you're like who's <laughs> gonna fly off you know I, I don't know who it's gonna be um but yeah it's an awesome awesome technique for sure that'd make a much more ent- entertaining sport that really wouldn't it dueling samurai dueling Can you imagine like those scenes in the knight's tale with like paul bettany being a hype man and then it's just two dudes with samurai swords charging at each other and just the crowd going nuts, like cheering as they run, and then slice, and then the crowd goes deathly quiet, just waiting to see what happens, the tension, the drama, and then, boom, someone hits the dirt, and the crowd goes, Wah! Yeah, there goes oh. Luis Suarez at long last. <laughs> Luis Suarez. I've decided it's going to be footballers I don't like, because then whoever, whoever goes down, I'll, I'll be cheering for it. Who would, uh, who would you like to see face off against Luis Suarez? Uh, post Manchester United, Cristiano Ronaldo. <laughs> oh, wow! Yeah, not not so much after he spent more time at Real Madrid. I started to to yes, he grew up. I started to respect him more as he became a man. But when he was a yeah. boy, that little punk. Well, for what is he did the, to Wayne Rooney, I was gonna say it's just it, the wink against the wink. Euro two thousand and four again, isn't it? Yes, yes, it you is. Still haven't let it's this all, go. I can't. There's that uh, who watches the World Cup reference, I think. I'm pretty sure we brought this up in the Daddy Issues too. You know? Did we? Cristiano <laughs> yeah. Ronaldo. So, Cristiano Ronaldo, Luis Suarez, Samurai Swords. They run across. We hear the thwap, 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 thwap of their sandals as they, they cross yeah. the, the sand. And then we'll see. Then we'll see. The thing is, with Cristiano being Cristiano, he'd win every single time. Like, he's just the best at everything that he does. Yeah, well, yeah, that's up until he faces off against Messi, who I don't hate so much. But then it's like, finally, it's like you've got Ogami against the greatest samurai in, uh, you know, in, in Europe. Who's it going to be? Because Messi is, isn't happy with the Shogun anymore either. He's leaving Barcelona. And, uh... He wants to leave Barcelona, yeah. <laughs> oh, dis- discord in, in the, the greatest empires of Europe. Yeah. Well, that bit that we just described there, that introduction is only the first half of this volume, right? That we, we move yeah. on to a second half, which generally the, the story is not quite as important. It's still an awesome, an awesome one. Um, but mostly the, the story is uh, Ogami's an assassin now and he's got to assassinate somebody. That's, that's pretty much, you know, um, that, that's it. Uh, we get some, some really interesting things with, with Honor where... It's like the servants of this lord feel that their lord is um, betraying the wills of the shogun. So they have said to, they've said to the lord, you know, you you can't keep betraying the shogun. um, So you have to stop. And the lord has said, no, I'll do whatever I want, basically. So they've they've left him and hired Ogami, the assassin, to to kill this lord in the shogun's name. But... um, you know, to do that, they they're gonna have to die. Um, yeah. And he he fulfills his role as uh, you know as the the executioner in speeding these men to their deaths and then creating a uh, a reasonable alibi for him to go and assassinate this dude, which he does. Right. That that's the kind yes. of that's the Ogami storyline. He's an assassin. He's got to assassinate somebody, and he does it. The more interesting part of this second half is Diagoro, I think, and. Uh, knowing that he's got to go and be an assassin, he leaves his son in a cave on his own and goes, you know, you're five years old, here's your food, here's your water, you know, don't eat or drink it all right now because you're going to need it for five days. Basically, I'll be, I'll yeah. be back in five days. That corner's for peas and poos. And... <laughs> yeah, that is literally what he says, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I'll see if I can, I can find that. But again, it's kind of rushing through this, but it's... Again, the art. There's a snowstorm that comes through, and the the lines on the so on the snowstorm are 
beautiful. And there's a great cinematic shot of Ogami pushing the, the baby cart through the snowstorm. Yeah. Um, that's just, just so gorgeous. Um, so we, many of yeah. these could be could be framed artwork. Oh it's, yeah, it's for amazing. sure. That's that's why when we get onto the MF Doom one, uh, the MF Doom track, the um, Books of War, why that one just that one image from Lone Wolf and Cub as the back of that video is just like it's just iconic on its own because it's it looks like a work of art, you know. Um, and I don't even know if it's from the books. It might just be a, a copy, uh, you know, someone doing um, uh, their own version of it. But those characters are kind of iconic and and beautiful um, in their own way. And totally. he leaves. Yeah, we, yeah, here we go. He leaves him some dried meat, some dried rice, and some water, uh, and puts him in front of a roaring fire. Says, I, this sh- here's your food for five days. Wait in the cave. If you get hungry, eat this. You get thirsty, drink this. Go to the bathroom. <laughs> go to the bathroom <laughs> over there, he says. Yeah. And whatever happens, don't go outside. Um, if I don't return, you too must die. Don't cry even if you feel hungry and if you're cold, endure. Death will come if you are patient. Do you understand, Diagoro? That is the way of the samurai. Um, says Diagora. Yeah, yeah he just, he just, every question he's asked, he just goes, um, which I'm, yes. and uh huh. So I, I, don't, yeah. I don't think he has many words at this point in his development, but he seems to understand. That's kind of the awesome thing about Diagora as, as a baby, is he, he's just, he's a child who seems to completely fulfill the role of the samurai, even though he, he's probably just following his father's example. You know, like just doing yeah. what his, you know, his his father says, um, but how much he understands is impossible to tell, right? Like it's got to go over his head, but he does exactly suppose, what his father tells him to do. But then, I know we won't go into it in detail, but in issue two, he kind of is out on his own, yeah, and he yeah. does know some shit. Oh man, that's a badass. Yeah, okay, we'll come, we'll do it later. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yes, we we've got. Ogami going out into the snowstorm, um, completing his assassination mission. But as he does that, the the cave that he's left his son in, there's an avalanche that comes down. And the avalanche covers the mouth of the cave and strands Diogoro behind the snow. Uh, meaning they, they can't, you know, he can't get to him now. Uh, he can't go back for his son, even if he wanted to, because the avalanche has, has, covered, it, has covered him over. And the father has no choice but to complete his mission and hope that when he comes back, the snow is soft enough to be able to, you know, to dig his son out, basically. Yeah, yeah. just the entrance to the cave is what is, has been obstructed by this avalanche. He's not, not buried yeah. uh, Diagoro, Diagoro himself. It's just uh, no, yeah, no. The, the, the pass is now uh, impassable. <laughs> yes, yeah, totally. And the, the again, the avalanche is so gorgeous and, and beautiful to see. There's not many times I'm like, oh, what a beautiful avalanche. But when it's drawn, it's drawn by uh, by Kojima, it's kind of difficult not to. Um, yeah, but um, yeah. I, so I want to just read this bit that um, when uh, when Agami realises what's happened with the avalanche, he's sort of, we have thought bubbles, he thinks to himself, I am powerless to dig you out, Daigoro. If only the snow keeps falling for the next five days, then there may be hope. How can I dare hope, Daigoro? At least go peacefully to your mother's side. I have no right to pray to Buddha, but the the beast-headed demons that guard the gates of hell, I pray for your salvation. And then he sort of turns to the men he's with. He's like, take me to the castle. He can do his, do his mish. Yeah, he, so, which he does. So he's, he's defeated the um, the... Uh, he's assassinated the guy and all of the the lord's men turn around to fight him and he basically says to them you know uh your lord was corrupt you allowed him to be corrupt and he you know he was building a castle he was not authorized to build and he was going to use this power to overthrow the king and it's like either you can continue to fight for your corrupt lord and i will kill you or if you want to be the honorable men then amend your ways, he says, and uh, yeah. everyone steps down and, and, and backs down from the fight. And then the next page is just beautiful of this castle that they've been building in a snowstorm. 
and um, Ogami gives a, a really awesome monologue. He's very good at m- monologues, is our, our Ogami. He says, oh, our yes. people are the castle, our people are the walls of stone, our people are the moat. Compassion is our ally, and hatred is our foe. War is a thing of men, like and not castles. Yeah. War is won in the assault, not the defence. Make corpses your stone. Bury the moats in bodies. Charge across the corpses of your comrades to crush your enemies, because that is the path to victory. Shinjen cool. Takeda went his whole life without hiding in castles. His bitter, bitter Kantari. I think Sh- uh, Shinjen Takeda was the man who hired him, I think. Uh, I think a Shinjen whereas... Takeda is like some founder of feudal to yeah. and legendary warrior. Yes, or, oh yeah, Takeda, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. went his whole life without hiding in castles. We were saying that's what this lord was trying to do, this corrupt man, you know. He wanted to win a war by building a castle and sitting back. Um, but yes, Sh- Shinjen Takeda went his whole life without hiding in castles. And there is a lesson here for me and Diagora. You know, it's to keep moving yeah. forward. Always move forward. You know, never sit back and wait for death to come. Um, yeah, keep keep going forward. And so he returns... He returns to his son, and then I, he, I'm pretty sure he causes another avalanche, doesn't he? Yeah. He's like, the, yeah, the only way I can dig Diogoro out of this cave is to blow another avalanche and hope beyond hope that, oh, here we go, one chance in a thousand that the, the, this snowstorm will sweep away the previous one. Yeah. Um, and uh, as he and comes upon the... the re- yeah, he comes upon the wreckage. There's just a, a, a tiny bit of the cave and he digs and he digs and uh, pop, out comes the head of, of Diagora. Who Papa. just said, Papa! Yeah, and then, <laughs> bam, the end. They've done it. They're on, they're on their way to another, another mission, to volume two. Oh, yes. Oh, it's so good. Right? Lone Wolf and Motherfucking Cub. Yeah. And uh, now, having read it, you can, and uh, we've, um, yeah, we've touched on the other things that we've talked about that were influenced by this. You can totally see it. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. With uh, specifically with, when we're harking back to our previous episodes, specifically, obviously, the Mandalorian and Rotopedition, which uh, I think the the writer of the graphic novel actually co- said this is an unabashed homage to, to Lone Wolf and Cub. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm really glad that we're kind of we're getting onto this now because we've spoken so much about father and son relationships that have been influenced by it, and some that, that have built upon it. Like we we do get more about the relationship between Ogami and Diagora as as the books go on, um, but the relationship between these two is more similar to the Mandalorian than to Road to Perdition. Like Road to Perdition, there the father and son relationship is a lot closer. Right, they have arguments. You know, they're they're closer in age, and although he follows yeah. what his father says, um, you know they are they are a father and son, and they they bicker like a father and son in, in a lot of ways. Whereas in this one, it's a it's a man with a baby, and you know he's gonna kick ass to the other side of the galaxy if we're following yeah. the Mandalorian. Like <laughs> that. Yeah. The other thing it made me think of: um, Have you ever seen the John Woo movie Hard Boiled? No, no, I know of it, but I've never seen it. Yeah, it's like a a police action movie f- mm. thriller thing from like the, from 1992 um directed by John Woo with starring Chow Young Fat and it's quite a bit of a cult classic I think mainly for the poster um which um I think it's from the third act of the movie where this um badass gun toting uh, cop played by Chow Young Fat called Inspector Tequila um has, rescues a baby and then there's a huge gunfight the whole time he's like he's like doing like bullet time sort of style yeah. diving gun fight stuff that John Woo was, was famous for in the 80s and 90s uh, whilst holding a baby the whole time just holding right. this baby that he's rescuing um, so I've, I I maybe watched that movie 20 years ago but I don't really remember it so are they I father really and watch son? It now. <laughs> no no oh. uh, I can't I don't remember much of the plot only that I do remember that an original plot idea because the original screenwriter for that this is a bit of a tangent the original screenwriter for this movie died before the film was made oh, so no. between the script being written and the film being made people came in and changed a lot of the plot and the particular the the main original plot point which they 
reversed or at least it's got rid of was that someone was poisoning babies in hospitals uh-huh. and stuff so for whatever reason this suspected tequila is busting up this criminal thing involving babies and one particular baby he tries to escape with and he has to shoot a bunch of guys to do it um yeah i'd love to watch that film again <laughs> Don't well really let's put it, it yeah yeah we'll have to put it on the list of uh father and son adjacent movies Lone, Jason, lone, lone yeah. Wolf and Cub adjacent movies. Maybe we can dip into it the next time we do Lone Wolf and Cub. We do another volume because we can talk about Lone Wolf and Cub and then add in a little bit of something else as well. Like today, we'll we'll yeah. talk about some some MF Doom. So next time, let's let's add in a bit on, a little bit on Hard Boiled as well, and we'll, we'll sure yeah we'll come into that discussion yeah okay. Oh, well, before before we move on then to Doom, mm-hmm. there's one other one other um, sort of uh, influence or. Um, I don't know, an instance in popular culture that I want to mention with Lone Wolf and Cub that I um, remembered about or sort of found, ri- was found written about while I was doing research. And that's an episode of Bob's Burgers. Right. I don't know if, you, if you've ever watched any Bob's I Burgers. I love Bob's Burgers. Yeah. I love Bob's Burgers too. Yeah, I think I, I'm up, we're up to season nine at the moment. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, all of it's great. But back in season five, there was an episode called Hawk and Chick. <laughs> and the premise of this episode um is that uh, Bob and Louis? Is anyone, if anyone does, isn't familiar with Bob's Burgers, um, Bob is the dad in this family animated sitcom, and his youngest daughter Louise, they have um, a kind of a bonding over this series of um, samurai movies from the seventies called Hawk and Chick, where a wandering barber who carries his <laughs> his um, infant daughter on his back um, has to fight monsters like giant jellyfish and right. big seaweed monsters and stuff and yeah it's like this what i i would had no idea of at the time but was a bit of a and i to be fair i can't find any evidence to suggest this was an actual homage but it's very much like it's yeah it obviously, Lone Wolf and Cub. Yeah, yeah, it obviously yeah. is but i can't find any evidence of that i should probably just point that out but um so i watched that before we started recording and it's the the plot of the episode is that um the the star who played Hawk, who's the the lone wolf part of this um, analogy. At the star of it, this uh, like 70-year-old Japanese man comes to the town where Bob's Burgers is, and they recognize him, like, oh my God, it's that guy. And it turns out the little girl who played Chick lives in their town, but they've um, their father and daughter, were, who are father and daughter in real life, and played Hawk and Chick in the movies, they've been estranged for like 30 years. So right. Bob and Louise help rekindle them. And at the end... I got really like a bit choked up. Like that yeah. actually was very touching because they parallel the story of the two actors who've become estranged, um, trying to rekindle with Bob and Louise, and them, and Louise kind trying to sort of come to terms with the fact that she has to grow up, and she's a af- she's af- she's afraid that if she grows up and stops being a kid and loses, I get it's, you know I'm reading into it, but loses some of her in- uh, innocence, she could become like. Um, this woman who's was once, the, well, as far as she was concerned, in the greatest father-daughter team of all time, mm. which she kind of wants to emulate with her own dad, and they, it just ended, and they just spent 30 years not talking to each other. So Louise and Bob had this really nice moment of, that's never going to happen to us, whilst these, you know, the two actors from the Hawk and Chick movies rekindle at the end as well. It was, re- it was really sweet. And I think they, I think they were, I can... I didn't find any evidence, but I can find a few links with Lone Wolf and Cub in that the act, the the character in Bob's Burgers who plays Hawk, they, he's called Mr. Kojima, and I think right. that might be a nod to yeah. Gozeki yeah. Kojima, who was the artist of the comics. I don't yeah. know, but that was a great thing to watch right before uh, right before we recorded this. Yeah, that's great. That's really cool. Yeah, I haven't seen that episode, so I need to go and check that out as soon as possible. Yeah, Season that's... five, episode twenty or twenty-one. Yeah, yeah, great, great shout out there. Yes, thanks, Dominic. You're all right. Well, that's let's uh, move on to to MF Doom quickly then. Um, mostly, uh, I'd just like this bit to be similar to our uh, playlist episodes that we've we've done before. Just like a mini a mini little bit, because um, MF Doom to me is uh, it's been a big influence for for a long time, um, especially also, often just in terms of. Uh, it being okay and it being cool to be a nerd in a lot of ways. Like, MF mm. Doom always wore the, the 
the mask referencing Doctor Doom, although I think it was actually the mask from Gladiator, but it was a, essentially the mask is Doctor Doom's mask, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, his whole character, his whole personality, all of like uh, the, you know, the the titles is the Mad Villain and and things like this. Uh, even his alternate names, uh, like King Ghidorah, and like uh, he was he was a nerd and and. Uh, in all the best ways and before the marvel movies and before it was you know socially acceptable to be you know before nerd culture was a billion dollar well multi-billion dollar property and it was still like oh you're into star wars uh before disney bought it you know like having somebody like mf doom who was so influential and uh who was just so fucking cool uh was yeah was, was important and um Especially looking at things like hip hop, where uh, the the culture that surrounds hip hop can be violent or um, can be, um, if you're looking at somebody like Kanye West, it can be very much like uh, hype hyper culture, right? Like um, uh, it it could be uh, culturally inaccessible. Because to live a life like Kanye West says that he li- that he lives, you know, you'd have to be like a billionaire or something like that. Whereas MF Doom was mu- was a, a much more of a, a poet, really. Um, yeah, more of an artist than a mm. entertainer, almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, that rings true. Yeah, and he was just great, and he was a British born, and uh, went over to America and. There's that really good Vox video that I think we've spoken about before. Explain that goes into uh, hip hop lyrics, and who were the best rappers of all time, and they spend a lot of time talking about MF Doom and how his rhyming structures are so unique in comparison to to other people. Yeah, and dense as well. Like he'll rhyme mm. within lines and then re- then repeat it later on. And yeah, those kind of Vox videos where they highlight his lyrics with the the bits that rhyme with each other in a couplets. Yeah, it's it's so dense and even yeah. before mf doom passed away if you looked him up on youtube there'd be videos like why mf doom is your favorite rapper's favorite rapper and stuff like yeah, that yeah yeah legendary yeah um, yeah and uh this is a slightly off topic but the last year um i was making on football manager with my friend alex we were making the latverian uh La- latveria is the country of dr doom and we made the latverian national football league uh, and we had to make all kinds of cities and different football teams. This was in, during the summer last year when we were bored during coronavirus. And one of our teams was called FC Dumail, named after uh, named after MF Doom's real name, Daniel Dumail. Um, oh, nice. So, yeah, we were, we were getting in references to him and how awesome he was. Um, and, yeah, it was just... Uh, he had a tragic... You know, I was kind of bringing him up for uh, father and son stuff because... Uh, his son died in, in 2017, I think. And yeah, it's just a, a tragic, a tragic story and a, a, a difficult life, but just awesome. R- such an awesome creator and so super talented. So I wanted to, to bring some, some music of his in here to just kind of to, for us to share some tracks that we really liked. Um, sure. Um, yeah, we'll just chuck them in as as we've done with with other playlists. So, yeah, I'd like to to throw in the first one would be the Omega Red track that I brought up earlier on, which is yeah, Books of War with with MF Doom and R Z A. <laughs> you had to say it. I did.
nothing like a fist full of cash or a blitz full of the hash that twists like a moustache from end to end, spread it like a rash from talking through your walkman or at your disco bash. Give me the Tim Rumpel, still skin brown, a metal face mask with a built-in frown, a mic to tilt down, a hundred thousand pounds, and see how kilt sound like spilt milk clown. Cocoa butter on a very ashy day, fam. Ray Bans out on the islands of Cayman. Or I break it down for the layman. Band aid soleil for the central pay. Tan a can of old gold. Too cold to hold. Slow your roll. Keep on moving like soul to soul. Hold the dough like a fool stole pity off. Trying to go up against city hall titty ball. The black mic is like a red violin. Okay, everybody back to the lab. Try again. Rap game like Leviathan. Leave bad taste. Killing my high like niacin. Stop kidding, middlemen need riddling. Hit me with the full tin and gin and I'm a kid again. Keep the bong light straight through the song right. The super villain, aka the thong biting, is inviting all to the reciting that's dope and raw. Hoping all y'all come in peace and it's open more. Tear the roof off this bumper rise clock by the end of the night. Spaz like shots by. I spilled a shot, made the pen lines runny. A ill plot to ten times Ben Stein money. Funny how he wrote the scripts with a straight face. With more rhymes and his lies in your database. Placing rappers in endangerment who's reckless With this food for thought, sorta of like breakfast You can mark it off as wreck on a checklist Wear gold fronts, can't afford no necklace Should that tend to go to help build them daycares? Somebody say yeah, pay your fears Give the herbalizer their shares Y'all can pay doom and beers I came to the shores of America The sky that's a pillar The alpha and the mega The home of the beggars, the black settlers Who've been beaten, raped, lynched, robbed, and stoned With a quarter of on the earth for service that they couldn't maintain at home this dates back to 1555 when they captured the first tribe of men and piled them in a pen 50 feet high. It took them all on the 9,000 mile ride. It landed on the shore of a place they'd never seen before. We read about this inside the ancient books of war. Bondage and stainless steel stripped of their language still survived the anguish of slavery but still remain nameless. Separated to portions, a chick by John Hardy Hawkins and sold on the auction, tore birth control and abortion. Rulers of the first part became slaves of the worst part. The devil's curse God and reverse God. They turned God to dog and made people so tired. No relief came to the prophet by W.D. Farad. Taught trauma, dropped our mamas off in Bahamas and Barbados, Tobago's. Separated us from slave boats. Made our own brothers hate us. From Virgin Isle to Jamaica, Trinidad, Honduras, Haiti, Grenada, Bermuda to Cayman, mental enslavement. Yes, I love that track. I think it's really great uh, for what is essentially a, a remix that's been that's been put together. Um, you have MF Doom. That that track, that verse of his, is from uh, "It Ain't Nothing." It ain't nothing off of uh, the Herbalizers' 2002 album "Something Wicked This Way Comes." Um, and then you've got uh, "As It Is." verse um, from The Night the Earth Cried, which is from the Gravediggers album. Uh, and then you've got that amazing instrumental, like we were saying, just those strings, like this haunting, almost, just put onto a, an amazing beat, uh, which it comes from a Cambodian singer, Sophia, uh, in the 70s. Uh, and it's just all of that comes together comes together really nicely. Supposedly, Sophia had to to hide the, these Western influences that she had because she was targeted by the Khmer Rouge. And, uh, yeah, so some hardcore shit going on there. Uh, but just creates a really unique song. There's not, not many songs I can think that, are, yeah, that pull the such disparate kind of influences and create something really different. And you, I can sit there and listen to that song for, like, hours on repeat quite comfortably yeah yeah you could definitely loop that and it really just it kind of really works as a 
not beautiful soundtrack to mm. Lone Wolf and Cub. Like if yeah. um, if you could just cut the instrumental into a loop and you could have that in headphones while just look reading through mm. the manga and it would, it would fit perfectly. And yeah, yeah especially cool since it's yeah, got those really different influ- influences and yet fits so well with a Japanese feudal um, yeah. narrative. Yeah, it's, that's really cool. Yeah. Was there an, an MF Doom track you'd like to uh, you'd like to pull up? I don't know how you can ask me to ch- pick one. <laughs> oh, um, I I don't know, man. But then MF Doom has kind of been, I think, kind of special to me in in terms of my and my kind of my sort of journey into becoming a hip hop fan. And I don't remember what came where I got into him first. I don't know if the first thing I heard was the album Operation Doomsday, mm. or if I somehow stumbled across um, Neruvian Doom first. Have you heard that one? I don't think so. That's his color. The great thing about MF Doom is his collaborations. Yes. Like Mad Villainy is one of the quintessential yeah. hip hop albums of all time. It's yeah, collab my, with Mad Lib and in- Yeah. I so see my other track that I was going to bring up is from Danger Doom, which is his one from uh, uh, his one with Danger Mouse. Yeah. Uh, that album is yeah, great which too. Which is great. It is great. And, but then the, yeah, Neruvian Doom was his collaboration with um, Bishop Nauru which he he's an MC he must have just discovered because he was like 17 or something at the time. Okay. And so he just plucks this MC out of nowhere and goes, hey, do you want to do an album with me? <laughs> and I, I can imagine Bishop being the Ruby and like, you fucking what? You know you're yeah. MF Doom, right? I'm just some kid. So, but that what I loved about that album, the Ruby and Doom, I listened to it so much, is um, that Bishop Naru's style is very, kind of very vulnerable. And as like a teenage rapper, he wasn't, trying to um elevate himself to be like a manly gangster kind of rapper he was talking about kind of teenage angst and being vulnerable and being scared and being uh, lonely and all this stuff and i think that really fits in perfectly with that with mf doom's legacy of Mm. um of of openness and how hip-hop is so many different things Mm. so you can be vulnerable and you can be funny and you can be all kinds of different things so if i if i was going to pick out a song oh geez like i i I love rhymes like dimes from operation doomsday um and it's like i say mad villainy there it's there just track upon track i listened to that whole album recently and you could just that it's like a piece of work in its entirety like there are plenty of albums that i love but i still only listen to a few tracks but if you're going to listen to Mad Villainy, you might as well listen to the whole thing because it just yeah. it's so perfect yeah. together. Um, I'm going to pick just because I'm looking at a list and I might as well pick one at random. Um, let's go with. Guys, oh, he's really struggling. This is this is the, this is a huge decision. I'm going to go with all caps from Mad Villainy. If you go on YouTube actually and look for. MF Doom all caps. There is a rhymes highlighted video. If any, if anyone, um, if anyone wants to really delve into Doom and listen to a great track and then just have a visual breakdown of how great he really is, just look at that. That is probably somewhat of a travesty having me Then he told the people you can call me your majesty Keep your battery charged He know it won't stick, yo And it's not his fault to kick slow Should've let your trick hold, chick hold your sick glow Plus nobody couldn't do nothing once he let the brick go And you know I know that's a bunch of snow The beat is so butter Peep the slow cutter as he utter the calm flow Don't talk about my mom, yo Sometimes he rhyme quick, sometimes he rhyme slow Or vice versa Whip up a slice of nice verse pie Hit it on the first try, villain The worst guy spot hot tracks like spot a pair fat asses Shots of the scotch from out the square shot glasses And he won't stop till he got the masses And show them what they know not through flows of hot molasses Do it like the robot to head spin to boogaloo Took a few minutes to convince the average boogaloo It's ugly, like look at you, it's a damn shame Just remember all caps when you spell the man name And you know it 
like a poet, like baby doll. I bet she tried to say she gave me her all. She played ball. All bets off. The villain got the dice rig. And they say he accosted the man with the slice wig. Allegedly, the investigation is still ongoing. In this pesky nation, he got the best con flowing. The pot doubles. Now they really got troubles. Madman never go like snot bubbles. You know what else is also great about that song? There's the video for that is um, an animated comic book. Mm. I didn't know that before I chose it, but it turns out to be the perfect choice. Well done, Dave. Um, and is he even like? Thank you, thank you. He even like um, plays with the the format of it being a comic book. It looks very comic booky, and there is bubbles and stuff. And then he starts to like jump between panels as if he's jumping mm. through walls. And like he goes to punch a guy, and the guy rips the page, so his hand disappears in the hole of the page. It's just great. Just the artist, the artist that is that is MFG. the artist. Yeah, and, and just, just like you just, were saying, like he made it cool to be into stuff like comics, and that yeah, and you're, it yeah. was okay to be a nerd or a geek or whatever is your preferred preferred term. Yeah, yeah. Just looking at because like, I'm looking at that rhymes video you were showing about, and it's highlighting everything, and it's just it's like a rainbow. It's just yeah. yeah, absolutely incredible, and so, yeah, so dense as you said, so dense with with rhymes that are all playing off each other, and I the most common type of rhyming in rap is the end of the you know is the the rhyme at the end of the bar. You know, you you have your line and then you rhyme the next line with the one before it. Um, but he's it's it's ridiculous. So it, just to to go off the the of two lines here. He's got do it like a robot to head spin to boogaloo. Took him took a few minutes to convince the average bugaboo. So we've got boogaloo and bugaboo, obviously. But then the way that he's rhyming it, you've got boo and took at the beginning of the next one. A few is the uh in boogaloo. Took a few of its rhymes with boogaloo and then bugaboo again. And he's just oh, he's he's ridiculous. He's ridiculous, Dave. He's all over the shop. He's, he is ri- he's rid- ridiculous. He's rhyming everything with everything, and it's just what a guy. Just what yeah. A I mean, guy. if you, I think if you like hip hop uh, mm. of any era, you owe it to yourself to 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 dabble in a bit of doom because he does everything as good or if not better than anybody else. Yeah. And what what yeah. what what was a requirement of me from the hip hop that I like is not it needs to have a production that i like too that the beat has got to be good the samples have got to be awesome as well as the quality of the lyricism Mm -hmm. and doom could did both like where he he would collaborate with other mcs so that he could do more of the production and his production is 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 incredible as well yeah and also that thing about constantly collaborating with other people is like especially with producers and things like that is he's not afraid to give credit to the people that he's working with, like you were saying with the the, the guy earlier on, like um, the fact that he's doing the the Danger Doom collaboration and things like that, is like um, he hasn't just said to Danger Mouse, "Oh, come in and, and do a track on my next album. Come and produce one." He's like, "We'll we'll do the whole thing, and you'll get part. You know, you'll get half the credit." Right? It's not like, oh, this is a, this is a, an MF Doom track produced by Danger Doom. It's like, this is us working together on on this. Yeah, and that's and, he, uh, they even changed the name, like the, the art, the, I don't know what you would call it, but the the album goes out under a, the name of the collaboration. It's not... Yeah, yeah. Everyone yeah. knows it's MF Doom and Danger Mouse, but it's, they call themselves yeah. Danger Doom. And everyone yeah. knows that it's Mad... Uh, it's Mad Lib and MF Doom, but it's that's not what the album is called. It's called Mad Villainy by Mad Villain. Like it's yeah. it's its own thing. He doesn't trade off his own name mm-hmm. or vice versa. So to be honest, when they did The Mouse and the Mask, Danger Doom, I don't know who was bigger at that point. Danger Mouse is pretty huge, I think. Then, yeah, at so, that point, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because he'd just done uh, with CeeLo Green. They'd just been doing... Uh, it's crazy. What were they called? Oh, man, what them. are they called? They're they're, they're the name. They right? had that, Green... They had like two. Yeah, see, they had, they had that that two two tracks that went huge. Niles Barkley. <laughs> Niles Barkley. 
Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so at that point, in 2005, like, uh, after Niles Barkley, especially, like, Danger Mouse could have gone and done whatever he wanted musically, you know. Yeah. And uh, he made Danger Doom, and it's well worth it. Well worth yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> well worth it. Yeah, I think that's a really nice way to, to bring us on to the, the last thing that we, we do at the end of all of our episodes, which is, did Lone Wolf and Cub or any of the, the work of MF Doom bear a particular relationship between you and, and your father? Did you see any connection with anything there? Um, not, not really. I, I mean, I know when we did uh, Road to Perdition, I had a lot to say about that relationship and how... Are related to it and obviously there are parallels in lone wolf and cub so again it's kind of a a bit of a, a duty and honor kind of conversation that i've had uh, many times before and that mm-hmm. i think is very much a facet of the way my dad lives his life and what he imparted onto me and now how i kind of live my life but this is a very highly stylized highly violent <laughs> world and story so I have no great, um, no, no great, no great parallels there. Although mm. the Bob's Burgers episode did nearly make me cry, and that was a father-daughter yeah. story. So you know, right. there, there was, there was something there. Do you think this changed the question slightly? Do you think your father would have done well in that samurai world, in which, uh, in which Ogami is placed? Do you think he would have been able to have uh, honorably served the shogun? I think he would have very honourably served the Shogun. And I'd, I'd have to remove all of his various physical injuries that he's attained over the years. The yeah, bad shoulders, the bad yeah, back. Yeah. That's because <laughs> he that was stuff. serving the Shogun. right? It's, it was. Know, well, if anything, yeah. yeah. yeah those, those injuries in real life came from his service to the Metropolitan Police. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the government, the, yeah. you know, the, the, the higher power. So yeah. I suppose he had them. And he's tall and he has a black ponytail so he looks a bit like a samurai but to, to, i'll try and take the question seriously <laughs> i mean how seriously can you take the question would your dad have been a good samurai <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a bit like if my dad was a samurai and your dad was a samurai who do you think would win in a fight um i think in terms of the the duty bound on the honor side of things yeah i think he would have served with great um great dignity and and poise uh i don't know about the violence side mm. of things um he's never that's never sat with him that well i know he boxed a bit when he was younger and he saw plenty of it as a policeman but that's never that was never in his makeup i think that mm. was the part about his his uh his duty that he hated the most so i think he probably would have set up shop somewhere in some village and just been a well-respected man amongst the uh the village probably mm. Yeah, I think my dad would not be best placed as a samurai because, firstly, he hates listening to authority of any kind. So (laughs) having to constantly be told what to do by somebody else wouldn't sit very well with him. Um, Have you read the the issue of Lone Wolf and Cub yet where he meets, like, a religious figure? That's yeah, really yeah, um, yeah. There's a yeah a priest that he yeah he uh, is a, he's hired to assassinate, but yeah he ends he's up having very, a very spiritual conversation yeah. with him. Yeah, that's a really good, a really good issue. I think my dad would have, would fit in better with that uh, with that side of that kind of traditional Japanese culture, the the more Buddhist philosophical side, rather than the um, executing people on the shogun's orders. Like dad would not would not fly for that at all. It just would, yeah, would not would not sue him. So, uh, but yeah, that's a that's a really good issue. We should come. Well, we'll definitely got to come back to Lone Wolf and Cub at some point. So, yeah, I'll look forward look forward to that a lot. Sure, but well, there are enough issues. What like twenty eight volumes of them? And oh my I've, god! I've, yeah. I've read four in the last couple of days. So yeah, there's plenty more to get through. Oh yeah, we're gonna have to think of a few more Pixar movies to do. Otherwise, it's just gonna be a Lone Wolf and Cub podcast. We're gonna have to transition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you everybody to for listening to to this episode. Uh, any ideas for what you want to do next week? Uh, no, not really. Are we gonna Are we going to address 
the the fact that we didn't cover the thing that we said we were going to cover in the last episode. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. We said next we were going to talk about Honey Boy with Shia LaBeouf, and then we didn't do yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Well, it was it's been a tough couple of weeks. I'm, I, we don't need to get into it here, but it's yeah. <laughs> All right, Honey Boy, Honey Boy. Next time, okay. I'm gonna watch May, him. maybe Honey Boy. Yes. Everyone. All right. But, yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Okay. Although, fuck well, it, we so, do whatever we want, don't we? So it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> fuck you, lone wolf and motherfucking cub. We are, we are two assassins on the assassin's road. We do whatever we want. And I've got a baby Yoda for us to push. While, I've got a, 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 ty- a small dog. <laughs> Get it in the car. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then, to, to play us out, let's, let's edit in a final MF Doom track. To, to play us out. Uh, I'd like to like to end this episode with Benzy Box by Danger Doom. But actually featuring CeeLo Green. Hey. Oh, how about that? R.I.P. Doom. Rest in power. His name's Doom. They wonder just who is he, but don't worry. Like jump rope, double dutch, and turn on the mic with a thumb stroke. Subtle touch, cuddle clutch. Is this thing on like the fling with Mrs. King Kong this spring gone? Sing a song of slap happy crappiness. He came to blow like it was strapped to his nappy chest. Surely I jest. The best on a wireless mic, not an eye test. Yet I digress. But why stress? Try and remember when. Maybe bit the tender skinned babysitter Gwendolyn. The type to hit and run and go tell a friend. Word to El Moreto, Cucaracha, Exoskeleton. He know, flow like interstellar wind. Toe a rap gin by his toe into hell again. Ahem, <clears throat> one, two, check, me too. Loose wreck, see through your gooseneck EQ. His name's Doom. They wonder just who is he, but don't worry. Believe me, you'll get busy when it comes to poetry. He's got plenty. La la la. La 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 la. la. Hey, if I may interject, rap these days is like a pain up in the neck. Cornier and phonier than a play fight. Take two of these and don't phone me on the late night. The beat won't fail me with more rhymes than times he washes hands and feet daily. And all that kerosene ain't cheap. Villain been deep since a teenage creep, peep. He always was a gentleman and kept a pen and a pencil in his mental den. Right there next to where the Rolodex was before it turned up all burnt by his solar plexus. He don't know his own strength. When he's on the bonus like the microphone's length and width. Ain't it funky like dingy socks? Feel the full effect off cassette in your Benzy box. His name's Doom. They wonder just who is he, but don't worry.